Welcome everybody. My name is Kathy Schultz and I am the Water Education Specialist with the California Department of Water Resources and I would like to welcome you to Water Wednesdays. We began this program back in May in response to the school closures and the stay-at-home situation and if you didn't have a chance to join us then but you'd like to catch up, our first eight programs are available on our YouTube channel. We took a break over the summer and today is our first day back and we are really excited to be here. With most California children still learning from home, we hope that parents and teachers will find uh, this a useful resource. And for the adults joining us, we hope that you enjoy this break from your daily routine. Today's presentation, if you haven't guessed by the large creature over my shoulder, is on uh, salmon. And this is the first of a five-part series that will follow salmon through their life cycle, from where they spawn and are born in the Feather River near Oroville, down the Sacramento River, into the Delta, and then finally out into the Pacific Ocean. The mission of the California Department of Water Resources is to sustainably manage the water resources of California in cooperation with other agencies to benefit the state's people and protect, restore, and enhance the natural and human environments. Salmon, like people, rely on healthy environments. In fact, the health of salmon is so tied to the health of the ecosystem that they are sometimes called indicator species. This means that if the ecosystem is healthy, then the salmon population should be too. However, if the salmon populations aren't healthy, well, this is a warning that we need to take steps to improve uh, their ecosystem, usually our rivers. Today's guest, Casey Campos, uh, will be talking about salmon and some of the studies that he works on to help gauge the health of our salmon populations. So before I turn things over to Casey, uh, I just want to go over a few logistics. We've asked you to turn off your cameras and your audio. Um, this helps minimize any distractions, background noise, like dogs barking, leaf blowers, all those things. Um, but we really do want to hear from you. If you've joined us on Zoom, you have the ability to ask Casey questions, things you've always wanted to know about salmon or things that he brings up during his presentation. And to do that, you just need to go down to the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a little, um, looks like a speech bubble with the word chat under it. And you can type your questions in there. And um, when he's done with this presentation, I will ask some of those questions to Casey. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, so feel free and pose them while he's talking after he finishes up and we'll get to as many questions as we can today. Uh, if you would like to have the closed captions on or off, uh, there's also a, a little button at the bottom of your Zoom screen with the letters CC on it, and you can click on that and the captions will either come up or, or turn them off if they're already on for you. And so that, I think that covers how we, uh, we run things on Zoom. Uh, again, welcome, and now I would like to turn things over to Casey. Okay, let me get set up here. You guys hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. Okay, great. So thank you, Kathy, for that introduction. Uh, my name's Casey. I'm an environmental scientist for the Department of Water Resources, and I work for the department's Feather River program. Now our program is responsible for monitoring and researching uh, the fisheries and ecology of the Feather River downstream of Lake Oroville in our California Central Valley. And I'm really super excited to talk to you guys today about one of my favorite animals, the Chinook or King Salmon. So Chinook salmon are also called King Salmon because they are the largest of the Pacific salmon. And Chinook salmon are a really important fish for California's economy. The largest Chinook salmon can get over five feet long and weigh nearly 120 pounds. And most of the Chinook salmon that we're gonna see in California and on the Feather River are closer to three feet long and, and about 30 pounds as adults. And that's still a really big fish. So Chinook salmon can live anywhere from two to seven years, although most are gonna live for three to four years. And before I talk about the work that I do, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Chinook salmon and their life cycle. 
So here's a neat map of the range of where Chinook salmon naturally occur in the world. And I think it's important to note that Chinook salmon have been introduced all over the world because of their economic and sport value. And in North America, Chinook salmon can be found from the Monterey Bay here in California to the Chukchi Sea in Alaska, um, and also across the North Pacific Ocean in Siberia and the Kamchatka Peninsula of Russia. And can you guys see where California is on this map? All right, California is right there where this star is. Um, and as you can see, we're really at the southernmost point of the range of Chinook salmon um, in, in their natural environment here. So Chinook salmon are an anadromous fish. And this means that they're born in freshwater rivers and streams, and then they're gonna immigrate to the ocean as young fish where they spend a large part of their lives. And after spending several years in the ocean and growing, the adults are going to return to the rivers um, where they were born to reproduce, or what we call spawn. And Chinook or King salmon can grow to these such impressive sizes because they spend so much of their lives in the ocean. And now we're gonna start getting closer to where the work that I do comes in. But first, when the adult salmon are ready to spawn, they're going to leave the ocean and start working their way to the rivers and streams where they were born. And in California, and, and where I work on the Feather River, these salmon are gonna to have to migrate into the San Francisco Bay. Then they're gonna to have to make their way through the Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta, um, up into the Sacramento River, and then into the Feather River. And they're gonna to have to pass several other rivers on their way. And they're gonna finally get to the Feather River in Oroville, just downstream of Oroville Dam. Um, in downtown Oroville here. So can you guys see this waterfall looking structure on the bottom of the photo? Well, we call this structure the fish barrier dam, and it keeps fish from moving upstream of this point. For our Chinook salmon in the Feather River, this is as far as they can make it upstream. So when the salmon are coming upstream and get to this point, they really just have a couple choices that they can make. So some of the salmon are gonna enter the fish ladders and go into the fish hatchery at the end of this yellow line here. Now in the fish hatchery, they will be artificially spawned by the staff there. And the salmon that stay in the river will spawn naturally as they have for hundreds of thousands of years. So in the Feather River, a large majority of the Chinook salmon actually spawn in this one and a half mile stretch that you can see in this photo. So here are a couple pictures of spawning Chinook salmon in the river. And what happens is beginning in September, when the water temperatures are cool enough, the female salmon are gonna locate a spot in the river that has the correct depth, the right water flow, and the right size gravel. And she's then gonna to begin to dig a nest in the bottom of the river. And she'll do this by getting on her side and moving her tail to lift the substrate or the gravel and move it downstream with the flow of the water. In the bottom photo, we can actually see a female salmon in the process of making her nest. So the nests that females build, we call reds, and we spell a red with two Ds, R-E-D-D. -D. So as the female begins to make a pit in the gravel, she's going to release some of her eggs. And the male salmon is then gonna come and fertilize those eggs rather quickly after they've been released. The female is gonna keep digging to cover up these deposited eggs. And she will continue with this process until all of her eggs have been released and covered up. So a finished nest or red will have several of these egg pockets in it. Okay, so Chinook salmon are gonna move a tremendous amount of gravel while making their nests. And here we have a photo, um, an aerial photo of a popular spawning ripple on the Feather River. And can you tell where the reds are in this photo? Okay, so the lighter spots in the picture are where the females have moved the gravel and cleaned it. And as you, and you can see a female and a male salmon in this picture and how large the red is in comparison to the size of the fish. We can also see in this photo one of our Feather River program biologists. And what they're doing is marking these red locations with a GPS unit. And that allows us to know the conditions that the, the salmon are choosing for making their reds. And this is gonna help guide habitat rehabilitation that we do on the river. So when the adult salmon have finished spawning, they will all die. And they, you know, having completed their life cycle by beginning a new generation of salmon. 
and all these dead adult salmon will feed the river ecosystem to which the young salmon are born into. And the dead salmon bring vast amounts of nutrients from the ocean. And when they decay, their bodies actually feed the bugs that the baby salmon will, will in turn eat when they're newly hatched. And all these dead salmon also make it convenient for biologists like myself to count and collect tissues and other samples from them. And this is really where the work that I do for the department comes in. So I oversee the Chinook Salmon Escapement Survey on the Feather River. Now, biologists use the term escapement to describe the fish that have escaped the ocean, whether that be from fishermen or predators, and have returned to the river where they were born to spawn. And we start our surveys in early September every year. We're actually starting our 2020 survey next week. And the surveys last for 16 weeks and end in late December each year. So each week, we're gonna search the upper 16 miles of the Feather River for salmon carcasses. And the main purpose of this survey is to determine the number or abundance of salmon that are using the Feather River for spawning. So on any given year, we can have thousands and thousands of dead salmon in the Feather River. And do you think there's any way for us to count all these dead salmon? Well, it would be great if we could, but there really is no good way to count them all, as some are going to move into areas that we cannot find them, such as in deep pools, under aquatic plants, and some are even gonna be removed by birds and other animals who, who really take advantage of this abundant food source every fall. So how do you think we're able to estimate how many salmon are spawning in the river? Well, the way we do it is by conducting what we call a mark recapture experiment where the salmon that have died recently are marked with a unique numbered tag. And then those marked fish are put back in the river to see if we can find them during the following weekly surveys. And we can make a really good estimate based on the number of marked salmon that we find again. So imagine if we mark a thousand salmon and find 500 of them again, we can really then assume that we're only seeing half of the carcasses that are in the river. So that rate of recapture of those tagged fish allows us to expand on the total number that we do see to make our estimate. So when we have all these fresh fish that are being marked or tagged, we're going to collect sex and length information from them. We're going to visually assess the female carcasses to see if they have spawned or not. We're going to collect scales to determine the age of the salmon. And we're also going to collect the salmon otoliths or ear bones for later analysis. So what do you think a salmon ear bone can tell us? Well, there's actually really a ton of research potential in looking at these ear bones. So as the salmon grow, the otoliths are growing and are using the minerals from the water that they're growing in. And each river in the Central Valley has a different chemical composition. The delta and ocean have distinct chemical compositions as well. So by looking at the structure and chemistry of the otolith really closely, researchers can tell how salmon used different freshwater habitats on their way to the ocean. So we're also going to collect heads from adipose clip salmon. And adipose clip salmon are implanted with a coated wire hat, with a coated wire tag as juveniles at our hatcheries before being released to the wild. So can you see a difference between these two salmon? Okay, so the one on the bottom is missing its adipose fin. And that tells us in the field that it has been implanted with a coated wire tag before being released from a fish hatchery. And from these tags, we can determine the contribution of hatchery fish to the total escapement. We can also assess the survival and stray rates of these different release groups of hatchery fish. So the tags in the hatchery salmon tell managers how well different groups of hatchery fish did because not all hatchery fish are released in the same location or at the same time. Some hatchery fish are gonna be released in the bay and deltas and delta, while others are going to be released in our rivers. And managers are also concerned with hatchery fish straying from the rivers that they were born in and ending up somewhere else as adults. So the hatchery fish that are released in the bay and delta might have a harder time finding and returning to their birth rivers at the end of their lives. And fishery managers really care about the fate of our hatchery fish because we don't want hatchery fish out competing or displacing the natural salmon populations that we do have left in California. So most of the salmon carcasses that we find are not going to be fresh enough to tag them when we find them. 
then these carcasses are gonna be counted and chopped in half with a machete. Now, why do you think we would do that? Well, we do it to prevent us from counting them again. And there are gonna be several things to consider when you're chopping one of these big fish in half. And I'll tell these to you in no real order of particular importance, but here we go. So swing like you mean it. You're gonna to have to make sure you follow through. You really be careful not to hurt yourself or your crewmate. But probably the most important thing is to remember to keep your mouth closed. Okay, so why does DWR care about how many salmon are in the Feather River every year? Well, it's in DWR's best interest to make the most accurate estimate possible because the Feather River is among the largest salmon populations in California. And the estimate we make for the Feather River not only provides information for management of our own salmon populations, but population data collected from the Feather is combined with population data from other rivers in California to forecast the number of salmon still in the ocean. And this forecasted population is then going to be used to set the next year's ocean commercial and sport fishing locations, duration, and the harvest quotas for the entire state of California. And I'm gonna finish up with some fun facts from the last 20 years or so of escapement surveys that we've been doing on the Feather River. So Mike Rowe from the TV show Dirty Jobs did an episode on the Feather River Escapement Survey. And don't worry, he got dirty. And if you look really close, he's got his mouth closed. The average in-river escapement over the last 20 years in the Feather River is over 62,000 salmon. So that doesn't include the fish that go into the hatchery. The largest estimate was in 2001 when almost 180 Chinook salmon were, 180,000, excuse me, Chinook salmon were estimated. And to make these estimates, we handle on average over 30,000 carcasses every year. And the most carcasses that were handled on any survey was in 2013, when over 78,000 carcasses were handled. Okay, guys, well, thank you for your time. I really enjoyed talking about one of my favorite animals, and I'd like to answer any questions you guys have. Great, thank you, Casey. It was yeah. really, really interesting. Um, I, I've got a question um, before I go to the audience questions. Has anybody ever forgotten to keep their mouth closed? You know, it happens, but usually it only happens once or twice and then you <laughs> learn really quick. <laughs> and you don't talk when you're chopping a fish in half, yeah. So you said you're going out um, next week, that, that's correct. correct. Uh, how, I, I assume that in addition to keeping people's mouths closed, they'll have the um, masks on their face while they're out there doing the- We will, we right. will. Um, and we're gonna be doing our surveys a little differently this year. Usually we have up to four people on one of our um, 18 to 20 foot boats. We're gonna be running um, crews of two this year. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna, it's gonna be quite a change for us. We're gonna, you know, kind of see how it goes, but everything's kind of different this year as, as we all know, so. All right. Well, I've got questions coming in, so I will leave my questions aside for now and, and get to some of the audience questions. Um, one of the questions is, um, do the salmon only spawn in the Feather, Feather River in the fall? Yes. So, well, they'll actually, some of them we do see spawning into early winter, um, as late as February, and those are called the late fall. Chinook salmon, it's just a really small proportion of the total number, so we don't do a, an escapement survey for those fish. Okay, so yeah. there, there's not a spring run in the Feather there's River? There's a spring run, but they spawn at the same time. So the, the spring run means they come up the river in the spring, and then they wait all summer, and then spawn in the fall with the fall run as well. Oh, how interesting. Where yeah. do they hang out in the summer? They're going to find a deep, cold pool and just kind of hang out and wait, yeah. Okay. All right, so they're, they're all born at the same time, but some come back in the spring and some come back in the fall. Right, roughly at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. over the course of a few months, three three months or so, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, a couple questions on the otolith bones. What, is, what does a salmon otolith look like? Oh gosh, um, it's very small. It looks like a kind of a white, <laughs> maybe like a scale almost. Oh, okay. You can think of what a scale looks like, but it's a little more irregular shaped um, and maybe a little thicker than a, okay. than, a, than a scale. 
so so kind of kind of flat and and maybe flat. round or right, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how do you how do you get the 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 data from that, knowing where they um, they were growing up? So so um, it's not me, but but researchers are going to actually um, sand those things down. And they call them polish them. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to look at them under a microscope and they, they can look at the structure. So, so how, how wide those growth rings are. Mm -hmm. And then in conjunction with some chemistry work to see, to see what the, you know, what those otoliths are made up of in those different, um, in those different rings, if you will. So, so you you're saying tell, rings. So it's kind of like, like when we look at tree rings, how those exactly. grow, kind of grows out like those. Exactly. So, okay. so one of those rings, you know, if, if one of those fish, ducks into say the Yuba River or the American River on its way down from the feather, we should be able to see that and kind of, and tell how, maybe how long they were using those different habitats on their journey. Okay, so you yeah. can look from the chemical composition in the, the water or the minerals. Right, okay. right. Are you able to tell where they go in the Pacific Ocean from the otoliths as well, or do we not have that kind of different chemical? No, signal? the unfortunately the ocean is is basically has one chemical composition, so we don't know from those ear bones where they go. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I don't have a, a really good grasp on what the salmon do in the ocean. I've kind of heard a little bit and read a little bit, but I think we're going to be talking to somebody who knows more about that in one of these later these later programs. So I mean, we, are. we actually have a that. guest speaker from NOAA Fisheries coming to talk good, about where, where they go in the ocean. Yeah, um, great. That, that story is often overlooked. Um, okay, so moving away from the otoliths, mm -hmm. um, what is the status of the, the king salmon or the Chinook salmon right now? You know, I think they're doing pretty well. Um, we just really have a, a small snapshot in time of, of what salmon are doing in the Feather River. You know, we've got good records going back um, 20 years and it, and it, and it fluctuates. Um, we've had a couple of down years and we've had a couple of big years since then. So really, you know, it's, it's time will tell. We still have a robust enough population to have commercial fishery. Um, it still supports a really viable sport fishery. So they're doing pretty well right now. Okay, great. Um, the the Oroville Dam. How does the the dam impact the the salmon's um, life or its its spawning? Well, they you know historically they would they would be able to go further up in the watershed. Mm -hmm. um, so you know it's just really it, it it limits their habitat. I would say their available habitat and their ability to go up in the mountains and and that's why DWR has to make sure we provide enough habitat and enough cold water for them, you know, in these downstream reaches. Okay. Um, and let's see, some really good questions. Um, did you actually, did you want, did you grow up wanting to, to work with fish? Did you grow up fishing or how did you get into um, That's a good question. working with dead fish? Yeah, so I grew up in Chico, so just, just a little bit north and in, uh, in, you know, up, up, not upstream, but just a little bit north of Feather River in Oroville. Um, I didn't really know until I was in eighth grade, we did a salmon in the classroom program. Mm. And that's where I really learned about these, you know, giant fish that come out of the ocean and spawn in our local rivers and streams. And, and that sparked my interest. Um, I did a lot of hiking and backpacking in the Sierras when I was younger. Um, and I love bringing my pole and catching fish. So that's really what sparked my interest. I knew I wanted to do something in biology when I was younger. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. And was, was, was working with dead fish what you wanted to be doing or? Well, at or that maybe point I had. a little less smelly? <laughs> yeah, at that point I had no idea that I'd be working with dead fish or even what an escapement survey was. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's a, it's a really important metric for for salmon managers is, is doing these escapement surveys. And, sure. and that's how I got into salmon in the Central Valley was on an escapement survey years and years ago. All right, great. Yeah. Was that when you were in school still or? It was uh, probably two or three years out of school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I worked on the coast a little bit. I got a degree at Humboldt State and stayed there for about a year and then came back to the, to the valley after, after that. If somebody wanted to become a marine biologist or a fish, fisheries mm -hmm. biologist, um, what what um, academic fields are available besides, um, you know, or, or classes should they take besides biology? 
Um, I think math is really a really important one. Statistics, um, you know, especially um, any kind of any kind of that kind of work. Um, mapping is a big one. We you know we use a lot of different things to to study these these fish. A lot of different disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, that's yeah, I would say those like GI GIS mapping. GIS, right? Correct, correct. And you know the the technology is just advancing and. You know, when I started, we didn't have half of the tools that we do now. So it's, it's really neat and you got to kind of keep up with it. So it's not learn something once and then go out and do it. You're always learning. Absolutely not. But you know, the thing that does stay um, is, is the math. That's okay. kind of one of those consistent ones. And yeah, it's an important, important one. Statisticians are like gold for us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was my favorite part of math. So good. Yeah. Um, two more questions for you. The first okay. one, what is the weirdest thing about your job? Oh, the weirdest thing? <laughs> I don't. I mean, <laughs> I just kind of showed you some weird things that we have to do. <laughs> um, the weirdest thing. I, it's just such a unique job, you know, and I tell people that that have never done this kind of work is that, hey, this is a really different, this is different than any job you've ever had. So, I mean, the weird weirdness, I don't know. <laughs> I think the weirdness is probably just the fact that you're out there with dead fish. For right, 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 right. Um, with all the fires that are going on right now, do you see that impacting the, the fish at all? I don't. You know, the, the lake is really a big buffer for any kind of, you know, runoff that might occur later on in the year. Um, if anything, you know, the, the smoke in the air is going to cool the water temperature a little bit. We get less, you know, solar radiation on the water. So, yeah, I don't foresee, you know, a couple years ago during the campfire, we weren't able to do our survey as normal because of the smoke. Mm -hmm. I think, if anything, it's going to affect us more than the fish. Okay. But I, I'm probably not qualified to answer that. <laughs> <Okay. really. laughs> um. So, if, if, you know, salmon... It sounds like this is a pretty healthy population, but certainly other populations of salmon in California are struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, what is something or a couple of things that people could do to help um, maintain healthy salmon populations? Oh gosh, that is a great question. Um, man, <laughs> that's a tough one. You know, I haven't really, I haven't really thought of that. Um, I think just, just being knowledgeable about, about the fact that these fish are, utilizing these habitats and these rivers and they're in our backyards. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a really important thing. Um, you know, just the way we interact with the river and, and when we go to the river, not, not, you know, littering and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And knowing that what we do, you know, in our driveways might affect the fish that are in the rivers downstream. So. Okay. With, so the, all those piles of rocks, like I know I have an 11 year old who loves to, you know, throw rocks in the river. Is that something people should avoid doing during, during spawning season? I don't know. You know, one of the things that we, that we say that we take care of when we're doing those, those red surveys and, and mm -hmm. cataloging the locations and the, and you know, where, what, what habitat they're using specifically, we try to stay off of those spots that mm -hmm. we know are going to have the eggs. So, you know, a couple rocks being thrown in the river is probably not going to hurt those little fish. They're pretty well protected in those nests. Okay. But you'd you'd want to avoid like standing on the areas where those egg pockets are. Fishermen, we, you know, most of the time have a good idea of the, of the nest and what's in the structure and what's, what's in there. So. So don't stand on the big piles of rocks. On the pile. Got right. it. All right. right. Well, Thank you, Casey, and thank you, yeah. everyone who joined from home. And I'm sorry I was not able to get to all of the questions, um, but I know some of your questions um, you can find answers to, um, for example, on our DWR webpage, uh, which is water.ca.gov. Um, there was a question about the, why the Oroville Dam was built, and you can find that. Uh, we also have educational resources, links, and materials that you can order um, from um, water.ca.gov backslash education. We don't have a lot on salmon, but some of our partners do. So you can also visit the um, Department of Fish and Wildlife. They have some uh, different materials on salmon if you wanna learn more about them. And they actually help manage that salmon in the classroom program that got Casey so interested in salmon in the eighth grade. 
Uh, there are additional materials available from some other partners, including NOAA Fisheries, which is a federal agency, and a number of their materials are available in Spanish as well as English. And then uh, redwoodempire.tu.org has some um, additional materials, including um, how to do a salmon in the classroom program. There's lots of great information out there on salmon. Um, and we have four more of the Water Wednesday series coming up um, on them in the next couple of weeks. We will be back next Wednesday at 1 o'clock p.m. to continue uh, the uh, voyage through the salmon life cycle. And uh, so that will be, you know, the salmon have laid their eggs and died and left out carcasses for Casey to chop up with the machete. Um, so we'll be looking at them as, they, uh, as the eggs hatch and they start to develop. And we certainly hope you will join us. Um, before we close out today, I just do want to take a moment to acknowledge everybody who is possibly suffering from the wildfires, the smoke, um, facing the hurricanes along the Gulf Coast, or hopefully recovering from the derecho in the Midwest this past week. It's, it's been a crazy couple of weeks on top of a, a, a rough couple of months, um, and this has been a really hard time for a lot of people, and our thoughts are with you. Um, so while we wait for, for next week's presentation, we hope everybody stays safe and we hope to see you here next week. Thanks again for joining us today and thank you so much, Casey, for telling us about your, um, your dirty job. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.